Welcome to the F5 book review for the first time in English. You guys asked for it. Here you go. This week, Training the Dark Side uh, from Richard Diaz, a coach um, in the OCR world. So if you're not in the OCR world, maybe you never heard of him. But his concept that we're going to talk about in Training the Dark Side is definitely applicable to any sports. So whether you're from the OCR Um, OCR world or if you're in uh, CrossFit or anything endurance or any type of sport where you believe that the best way to train is to segregate and segment your training with classical periodization then I think that you're going to benefit tremendously into taking a look at what Mr. Diaz has to say about the last probably we can say 50 years of experience in training athletes. So, first of all, if we summarize in a nutshell, the book is exactly what I just said in the opening. Richard basically came to the conclusion after he's 68 now and he's been training athletes all his life, himself in also triathlon and now he's in the OCR, Spartan World Championship, you name it. And he is a clinical, he has a clinical or an empirical uh, approach to the sport which I really like which means that like whatever he talks about is not just in his head it came from measured observation and he has all the data he, he fits the, the role of a scientist and also a practitioner that knows how to apply what he talks about and the main message that he has so if you want to know right away what the book is about is if you believe that segregating anaerobic aerobic Uh, if we talk running like hill training and then do stuff like okay today I'm going to the track and it's a time trial and then tomorrow I need to do an aerobic long run if you if you train that way it's not that it doesn't work obviously uh, it works uh, the classical periodization from Bamba has been proven that you can win some medals but it's not optimal so like I said What I really like about Richard's book is he doesn't necessarily say that everything else doesn't work. He makes a difference between training traditionally, training maximally, if we talk about like Louis Simon talks about in the conjugate method, versus training optimally. So basically this book is all he's learned and what he's applied with his athletes to train optimally. Now, is this going to change? Probably if we talk to Mr. Diaz in five years, he's probably going to have stuff to add. But I think he's on to something and that is flow training that we're going to get into is definitely the base of something that we can use. Yes, in endurance sport. Yes, in CrossFit. He talks about this new thing, the IROX competition too. That works too in running. We can absolutely use that. Uh, use that there. So he's very similar to Greg Lassman, Louis Simmons, Stuart McGill. He really just measures his observation and then tries to figure it out. He's not scared to, to shake the statu quo, even if that was the way that he used to train athletes and to just move forward and see that there is some stuff that is really weird. Like at the beginning of a, the book, like, you know, he's like, okay, so how can we explain that some people go above their aerobic threshold and they run, bike, swim for more than nine hours and they still have energy, right? That doesn't seem to necessarily work if we just use the regular classical approach that they're just going to build a lot of uh, lactate and it's going to be acid and that's it. It's, it's over. So probably my, to my knowledge, Richard is like one of the first one to bring the concept of of flow training to the endurance world. Uh, something that we definitely talked about in some other of my podcasts or if you uh, come to one of my gym like in, in CrossFit, definitely something that we understood that training, your body doesn't make the difference between the ways and the method they, it uses to generate ATP. It, it doesn't work in compartments. And like Richard says in his book, it doesn't make sense, for example, to feed someone only carbs on one day and then only fats on the other day and then only protein on the other day. 
you mix it and the power of a good meal to recover if uh, you want to have a, a, a summary about good to go like tons of methodology to recover but if you want a good recovery meal or if you want a good meal to to build your muscles or maximize your uh, your gains as an athlete you're going to need to mix and match all these macronutrients in the best recipe and it's the same thing for training once again it's not that it doesn't work to do only a track day on that given day but it's not optimum we could maximize the gain of that session by mixing it now at first let's let's talk about is concept of virtuosity i'm a big fan of that word virtuosity doing the common uncommonly well and that comes from gymnastics and in gymnastics basically if you want to have the highest grade you you can't just do a perfect routine you need to either add to that routine a, a new element or a new dimension of risk or virtuosity doing whatever everyone else does but just much better and for him, the virtuosity in running, because the book is really about running, because for him, obstacle course races, if you're a top dog, 90% of obstacles you can just do with your eyes closed pretty much, and it comes down to running. So his concept of virtuosity is very similar to the Chinese concept of Wu Wei, where it's effortless action, right? What is the cost, right? And what is your efficiency? So how much energy or ATP can you produce regardless of which metabolic pathway that you use and then so that's what can that's what your effort can cost you and then how efficient are you at using that ATP that energy that you generated in order to to maximize it right and is so, so once again it's the concept of like optimal training versus just like training maximally and just doing he talks about days at the track where like people hate it because usually you're just against the clock. You don't think about technique and you just push yourself and you believe that like just like no pain, no gains, right? If you just push harder, you're going to get more results. But like we know in, in multiple of methodology now, it's not about doing more practice sometimes it's perfect practice that will make you perfect it's not necessarily more of the same and he uses the the quote from einstein that says like insanity is basically doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result and sometimes that's what we tend to do as athlete we just put our head down and we do the work and we expect something magical to happen so if you don't run well, basically you have no business running faster. That's something that he says because that's a, receipt, uh, a recipe for disaster, right? So just like in, if, if you read um, Born to Run, uh, and there, there's a character called uh, Caballo Blanco, and you can watch also his, uh, there's a movie, a tribute to his life on uh, Vimeo On Demand, Caballo Blanco, Run Free. And, and basically he has the concept of easy running then light then smooth and then that will bring you speed so just adding speed to something that is not a well-oiled machine that doesn't have efficiency is not a good idea right so you you can't you can't really learn how to run in a book right but he makes a really good effort at explaining the mobility that you need the stability that you need some drills that you can do some mobility that you can do to be better and, and basically for that, if you want, you, you should pretty much read the book if you want to go into this. But just like in Born to Run, Richard is in line with the fact that you need how to run. You need to learn how to run more uh, naturally. So if we, if we want to say like barefoot runner, not necessarily like, you know, obviously when his athletes run races, they have shoes. But like just understanding how your foot actually works and now you can be more efficient with using the rebound of the, um, of the ground and then the stiffness. Where do you need stiffness and where do you need mobility in your foot and in your leg? Which muscles will just like load with energy and then allow you to have like a longer stride, for example, and keeping your stride underneath your knee and your hip is, is all stuff that he talks about. It's something that he does in his clinics. Let's keep a little bit of mystery. Read the book if you want to know about this. This is not the key point, right? The key point though is training the dark side. So what is the dark side when you start to fatigue, right? And 
Some people fear it, some people expect it, and some people thrive in, in fatigue. So when energy depletion happens, we used to think that that was like the fatigue. But if we, if we read Team Noakes, that uh, there's another summary I talked about in Waterlog, it talks about hydration, but Tim Noakes also worked a lot on fatigue. And for him, it's more neurological, right? Tim is gonna explain that basically, even though you think that you're empty, your body can still produce energy. And his classic example is when you see someone battling out in the last marathon of the Ironman, they seem to have no more energy, but when one, one of the athletes breaks the elastic, the other one just stays behind and then he goes on to win. He was about, the, the, the winner was about to crash in the last 10 kilometers, but then he crosses the finish and he's waving and he's taking interviews. He still has energy, right? So we know that fatigue is not just energy depletion. There is heat production, production obviously, but when you overeat, obviously it's gonna make you slow down. If you're a bigger athlete, you're gonna overeat easier like on a race course than, uh, than a smaller athlete. And, and it depends if you're uh, adapted to the conditions, that's, that's obvious, but that's not only what creates fatigue. Muscular recruitment fatigue, so if you move inefficiently, obviously you're gonna fatigue much, much earlier because your cost is gonna be more. The classic like person that finishes the, the race like this and they're broken down, their core is like leaning forward and it's, it's not, obviously it costs them a lot more to do the step forward. They don't use gravity to their advantage and it's obvious that they're more fatigued and slower than the athlete that runs with a more efficient technique, that's, that's for sure. The external environment also will cause your CNS to slow you down. So for example, if it's extremely cold and you're not used to it, if it's extremely hot and you're not used to it, if it's slippery, if it's raining, if it's a terrain you're not used to, if it's at altitude and not altitude. So all this obviously will also create the fatigue. So how do people keep pace above aerobic states for hours? It was really known for, not known, but it was a mistake to think that lactate production that is toxic was like what was causing fatigue. And now we know that that lactate, obviously if it's built too fast, then you can reuse it because we can reuse it to regenerate energy directly. Boom, the glucose will go right back into, it'll be transforming glu glucose and go right back into the, the muscles. But if we produce it faster than this can happen, then obviously it becomes a toxic environment and it's gonna slow you down. But lactate is, is something that you need to improve your tolerance to, obviously, and improve the mechanism by which you can reuse it as fuel, right? So it's not only, it's not necessarily the bad guy. That's, that's what we need to remember. And that's, he talks about read the, so you should read it, the lactate paradox in the, in the book, and he goes in depth in explaining all of it. Now, we start to go into the flow training. So the, what is the first problem with segregating your training? You know how to stay in fat burning zone, in aerobic, 100% aerobic, and you know the heart rate you need, you know what's your VO2 max, you know all of this in training, right? You know like your 400 meter repeat, your 1K repeat, and you know how much time and rest you need, and you always do it separately. And then when the gun goes and you start, you throw all of that out the window and you start to race your buddy, right? You, you don't follow your race course pace. You just go at the pace that you need to position yourself within the people that you want to beat. And then that could be an entirely different video, but obviously there's the picking order, right? You know who you can follow, who you shouldn't follow, and who like shouldn't beat you. And you, you kind of like place yourself there. Sometimes you outdo it a little bit too much. A little, you stay behind a little bit too much, but you do not race like you train. And that was the first thing that made him realize that we need to train differently, right? So obviously knowing your cost, so doing, getting some data with your heart rate and your VO2 max is a big tool that Richard uses because you know the cost, now you can see, for example, if you get a better time at the same cost, then your efficiency improve. It's, it's good data and data doesn't lie, like he says, that's what I really like. 
And that's why I said that he's very similar to uh, Louis Simmons and Greg Glassman for that, or Stuart McGill, because they like to collect data and not just go with like subjective stuff. I feel like this, they can back it up. And, and if you want to see it, you can just read in the book and he'll explain. But the idea of, is like you cannot just be by feel, right? And just never train that race day and the feel of like racing your body. Or you cannot just be by the data and just going by your heart rate or your VO2 max. You need a hybrid of these two things. The data, right? So like the scientific way of running a race and then the feel racing your body. And if you never put that in your training, you're gonna be suboptimal, right? It's not that it's not gonna work, but it's gonna be suboptimal. So what is the flow concept? The flow concept in the book, it looks like a infinity, it looks like an infinity uh, symbol, like an eight on its side. And, and basically you have a spot where you start and Richard uses icons. So there are some icons that are gonna be um, your variable, variables, for example. So you'll have your, a different terrain, right? Your icon for your cadence, for your aerobic effort, for your time trial, for your motor skill development, for your anaerobic, for your VO2 max, VO2 max hill, recovery, breaks, weight training. So these are all different icons that he defines in the book and that's his way to do it. And depending on your sport, you might need different icons, right? Let's, let's stop right there before we go more in depth. What I really like is that Richard doesn't give you, um, he doesn't give you a recipe and it's like, here's the program, just follow this, don't ask questions, do it. He gives you a concept, the concept of mix and matching all the variables that you will need for your sport. And just like we made the analogy of eating, you're gonna find some recipes. There'll be some mix and match that are like hill flows, right? Track flows. They could be some recovery flows if you want. If you're a CrossFit athlete or IROX athlete, they could be some weightlifting flows. So, so basically you'll have a different percentage or like how much aerobic you did on that day, anaerobic you did on that day, or terrain, or hill, or weight. And then that becomes your recipe and the way you position it too becomes the part of the recipe. And just like any good chef, you need to know when to deviate a little bit from the recipe. Right, you, you, you don't stay stuck like it's 400 meter, it's exactly like this. Why? Because sometimes when you go in your terrain, the terrain is gonna dictate how long the hill is, how long it takes you to do it, how, when is the downhill. So you start to go a lot more like in a race, right? Where sometimes you're gonna go, you gotta have to sprint that first K because you wanna stay with the people that you wanna beat. So maybe it wasn't the plan, but you gotta go anaerobic, boom, from the start. And then you gotta go at a recovery pace because you know yourself, now you have some good distance, the obstacle is coming, and for example, you go at a recovery pace. And that's gonna be longer or shorter depending on competitors, how you feel, the obstacle, and the terrains. And that's exactly what you keep reproducing in the flow concept. So you have your variables, and then you create your flows, right? He does, um, most for like obstacle course racing, like his sessions are around like 50 minutes to an hour. And sometimes they'll be a bit longer, like we said, like in, in no pun intended, but you go with the flow. And, and, you're gonna get, and you're gonna have, for example, if it's a track, obviously there'll be like a few more time trials, but then there'll be some aerobic, there'll be some technique into there, there'll be some, some potential breaks or recovery. And then basically you never stop moving and it becomes just like a race environment. And these flows that he gives you are just examples, things to try and then see how you improve, retest, follow the data, right? And then see if you can tweak it a little bit for you, for your goal, depending on what it, when is your race, what is your goal, and what type of athlete you are, right? So your, your goal is gonna be to measure and start to make your own program, or at least have some input with the programming that he has so you have a starting point right? you, you don't want a strict plan that's like probably also his main message is you don't want to be the lazy athlete with i call it like the old uh, the old athlete were not in age but in old days where 
the coach would be at the center, they'd be the athlete, they'd be the strength coach, the nutritionist, and the coach would be the liaison with everything and just tell you what to do. Nowadays, that we see in every sport, and Richard is on board with this, his, his system is basically the athlete is at the center, and then you have your coach there. You might have like an aerobic coach, a weightlifting coach, sports psychologist coach, support. You might have your technician. And the athlete basically is the, the leader of that orchestra in order to generate their own uh, programming. So we, we need to go away. That's the main message. We need to go away from a track day, aerobic day, or just a weightlifting day. We just blend it and just like we saw huge results by doing this in CrossFit, basically Richard now has the data that this works for an aerobic sport. This worked for an anaerobic sport. This basically works as the framework that you can use for almost any activities. So the concept is in the book, the bottom, the not the bottom, the end part of the book is really like a lot of examples of flows and with explanation of how you can do it. And I strongly suggest that you start practicing and experiencing with what's already in the book. And then sky's the limit. You basically, you want longer session, you make them longer. You want shorter, you make it shorter. You want, you, you want some CrossFit modalities in it. You add monostructural, the running's already there obviously, but you can add with a ski erg, with a bike erg, air bike, you name it. Then we can add like the weightlifting, you can add the gymnastic. You just play with a concept with different variables and then see where it takes you. So overall, great book. I recommend that you, you get it and you read it. It's a nice reference book to have. I think it's cool to have it in paper, not just in an electronic version, because this way you can go back, uh, back to it. It's in color, so it's always enjoyable to, uh, to read and actually feel uh, the book physically. I hope you liked it. If you have any suggestion for the next books, please put in the comment below. If you like it, give me a thumbs up, maybe subscribe to the channel. And until the next book review, train hard, try some new stuff. Don't stay stuck in one single-minded way to view sports. The future is coming and it's exciting. Let's go.